Acts chapter 1, verse 30, speaking of the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive. I've entitled this message, He Showed Himself Alive. Don't you want Him to show Himself alive to you? You know He lives. You want Him to show Himself alive to you. You can genuinely believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. That he actually rose from the dead. I believe there are probably millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, that really believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. It really took place. And I know this, I want to believe the resurrection not simply because there is credible witnesses of it. And there is. 1 Corinthians 15, he was seen to 500 brethren at once. Now that, that's going to pass any court of law. I mean, there's credible witnesses that he did raise from the dead. But I don't want to believe that simply because of historical facts and credible witnesses. I want to believe he was raised from the dead because he showed himself alive to me. Oh, I pray that that's what the Lord does for us. Not, to show himself alive in who lives to me. Now notice it says to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. Now the word passion means sufferings. And the Lord is called in Isaiah chapter 53 a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. As a matter of fact, he said in Psalm 88, and remember when you read the Psalms, this is the Lord speaking, first of all. He said, I've been afflicted from my youth. His sorrows and afflictions that he experienced as a man for the 30 years before entering his public ministry. But the main sufferings, you know, is the sufferings that he experienced as the sinner substitute. You know, every time I try to talk about that, I feel way over my head. And I am way over my head because there's no way that anyone will ever understand his suffering to other than him, his Father, and God the Holy Spirit. No one else could possibly enter in to these sufferings. He suffered being forsaken by his father. His love, his eternal witness with the father. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. He was eternally with God. He said daily I was in delight as one brought up before him. On the cross, when he was forsaken, that witness was broken. Who can understand that? And in his passion, he experienced the completeness of damnation. The completeness of being cut off by his father. No longer feeling the presence of his father being completely abandoned by his father, suffering the full weight of the damnation, being made sin. And this is, once again, something there's no way we can ever understand. We know he's impeccable, that in his life he never committed sin. But he became deeply acquainted with sin on the cross. He never sinned. He knew no sin, yet he knew it intimately on Calvary's tree. He felt all the shame and humiliation and embarrassment. Oh, the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ when he became the sinner's substitute, when he was made sin. 
And you know we're really not going to understand him living, him who lives, until we see that he died. And why he died. He showed himself alive after his passion. Now, I love the sixth statement of the Savior from the cross. It is finished. That is so filled with meaning. But part of it is the passion's over. The sufferings are over. There will be no more suffering. Of course, it means the full salvation of all of God's elect. I love those words. But no more suffering. And his sufferings, when we talk about his passion, his sufferings accomplished something. They did something. I love that verse of Scripture. They spake of the disease which he should accomplish. Something was actually accomplished by his suffering. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says he was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And the moment he died in his sufferings, complete satisfaction was made. Now, I don't know what was going on. I wonder. I guess I'll never understand. I don't know what was going on those three days between the Lord's death and his resurrection. I don't know what was going on, but I do know this. He walked out of that tomb. I love to think of him all of a sudden opening his eyes. He was dead. And all of a sudden, he is raised from the dead. And he made complete satisfaction for everybody he died for. Now, it will not do us any benefit to believe in the reality of the resurrection. Well, I believe Christ was raised from the dead and yet not have any understanding of the reason for his resurrection and the results of his resurrection. What actually took place. But well, see, the resurrection is the cornerstone of the gospel. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostles were called witnesses of the resurrection. And if he has shown himself alive to you, if he's shown himself alive to me, I'm a witness of the resurrection, just like they are. Oh, Lord, show yourself alive to us this night, just like you did the apostles. Now, why was he raised from the dead? Because God was satisfied with what he did. Beloved, God is completely satisfied with you. How satisfied is he with Christ? That's how satisfied he is with you. Right now, all the time. Well, what about my sin? My sin has been put away. It's been blotted out. And the only way that you and I are allowed to look upon our sin is forgiveness of sin. Cancel sin. Blotted out sin. He was raised from the dead because God was completely satisfied with what he did. All the claims of God's law and justice for those he died for paid. Now in his death I think it's so significant that the scripture points out that he never saw corruption. There was no decay in his body. I know he was in the grave for three days, but it would have been no different if he would have been in the grave for three million days. There's still no decay in his body because when he died, God said, I'm satisfied. There's nothing else is needed. Absolutely nothing. That's what the death of Christ did and accomplish the full and complete salvation of God's elect and he was raised from the dead because the sin of every believer was put away and they were justified. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? I, I, I love the boldness of that statement. Bring it on, Paul says. Bring it on. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justified them. Who is he that condemned? It's Christ that died. 
Yea, rather that's risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. Now, Christ died not only for the justification and complete salvation of his people. We read in Romans chapter 14, verse 9. I love this. I want you to think about this. Christ both died and was buried and was risen, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. Now, who are the dead? Unbelievers. Unbeliever, Jesus Christ is your Lord. You may say, no, he's not. You're nothing more than a pawn in his hand, and you're going to be bring glory to his name. He is your Lord. Believer, he's your Lord. And you want him to be. He was raised from the dead that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. I, I love the simplicity of that statement. He is Lord. He's everybody's Lord. Whatever's going on, he's in control of it. Somebody says, he's not my Lord. Yes, he is. You might not know, but he's your Lord. And you're doing his will. And you're accomplishing his purposes. Everybody is going to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. You might glorify his justice. You might glorify his grace. I know what's ready to glorify his grace with you. But everybody is going to glorify him. And he is everybody's Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead. He is Lord. That's why he died. He achieved this lordship. And it's so comforting. To know that he's everybody's Lord. He's the dead Lord. They might not know it. They might not like it. But he is anyway. He's the Lord. Both the dead and the living. Now his resurrection. In his resurrection. After his passion. And he was raised from the dead. He put death. To death. Now what do I mean by that? Well there are people. In the Old Testament, they died, and God restored life to them. Do you know what? They died again. What about, about the people that Christ raised from the dead? Lazarus, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Do you know what? Lazarus died again. Didn't he? Uh, he raised the little maid from the dead, but she died again. He raised the widow's son, the widow of name. He was. Brought to life while during his funeral, while they're carrying his coffin. He got up, but he died again. Now, when Christ was raised from the dead, he'll never die again. And he became the first fruits of them that slept, the scripture says. So everyone he died for, they're never going to die. Once they're raised after that last resurrection, there will be no more death. Nothing but perfect likeness. To the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I think it's amazing. Well, it's not, I shouldn't say anything's amazing. Return with me, First Corinthians 15. As soon as I say it's amazing, for somebody to believe something like this, I'll start believing the part of the grace. So I'll be careful when I say something like that. But look what was going on here in Corinth. Now, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? They had this going on in the church of Corinth. They had people say there is no resurrection of the dead. Now, I don't know if they meant that when you die, your soul goes straight to God and there's never going to be a resurrection. Your soul is going to be with God and that's it. Or I don't know if they meant there's no afterlife. Uh, but whatever they meant, Paul confronted this error. And he did it in three ways in this uh, passage of Scripture. First, he did so by authority. I declare unto you the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that he was buried and that he was rose from the dead according to the Scriptures. Now that first, here's how he answered this. This is what the Bible says. Somebody says, I don't agree with that. It doesn't matter. This is what the Bible says. And that's the divine authority of it all. And then, secondly, he used witnesses. There in verses uh, 5 through 9, he talked about Peter seeing him and, and uh, the 500 brethren at once and him appearing to James and last of all, him appearing to me as one born out of due time. He was using the credible witnesses. He made himself known to these people. They... They're witnesses. This would stand up in any court of law that it actually took place. He used 
the credible witnesses. First, the divine authority. God said it. It's in His Word. Second, the witnesses that have experienced this. And third, He used some logic. And I love the way He used this logic. Look at how He uses it at the beginning in verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ did not risen. He's still in the grave. And if Christ be not risen, our preaching is vain. It's a waste of time. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is useless. It won't do anything for you. I don't care what it is you say. Verse 15, yea, if he's not raised from the dead, yea, we are found false witnesses of God, because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. We're telling lies on God. We're saying he did raise him, and he wasn't raised. Verse 17, 16, if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You again in your sins. Your sins haven't been forgiven. They haven't been put away. If Christ is not raised, you're still in your sins. And you're going to have to stand before God in judgment in your sins. And then he says in verse 18, They, they also which fall or fall asleep in Christ are perished. They're not in heaven. They perish. They perish under the wrath of God. And Christ did not raise. <coughs> verse 19, If in his life only we have hope in Christ. We are of all men most miserable. I mean, you think of uh, everywhere Paul went, he was beat, he was he was stoned, and nothing but a life of continual trials. If there's no resurrection, then what's the point in all this? We're of all men most miserable if there's no resurrection of the dead. But if Christ be raised from the dead, he was. Our preaching is not vain. God begins his word. And it's never going to return to him for it. It's going to accomplish whatever he intends to accomplish with it. Your faith is saving faith. Not vain faith, but saving faith. We're true witnesses if he's raised from the dead. We're telling the truth. And if he's raised from the dead, I know that my Savior. What a blessed thought. I'm not in my sins. My sins are, if he's raised from the dead, my sins have all been blotted out. The ones I haven't committed yet have all been blotted out. They're gone completely. If he was raised from the dead. Dead believers are in heaven. And beloved, we can say of all men, we're most happy. It doesn't have anything to do with our circumstances. It's because he's Lord. And because our sins are put away. And because we're accepted in the beloved. And because we know that even with all the difficulties that may take place, all things work together for good to them to love God, to them who are the call according to His purpose. Now that's His resurrection. If He shows Himself alive. And notice in our text, Acts chapter 1, verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. Now, after he was raised from the dead, he walked on this earth for forty days and made these different appearances to his disciples. I think it's interesting. Forty is some kind of special number. Um, how many days was Moses? On Mount Sinai, 40 days. How many days did it rain? 40 days. How many days did Elijah travel on the strength of that one meal? 40 days. How many days was the Lord tempted by the death of death? 40 days. Now he showed himself alive for 40 days. Now, has he showed himself alive to you? I can tell you how you you believe the gospel. That's the only evidence that's needed. Do you believe the gospel? Right now, do you look to Christ only as everything in your salvation? Do you believe He's all in your salvation? Do you believe that His righteousness is the only righteousness you have? 
Do you believe that his shed blood is all that's needed to make you perfect and complete before God? Do you, do you trust him wholly? If you do, it's because he has shown himself alive to you. That's why you believe. Because he has revealed himself to you. And during those 40 days, what did he speak of? Look at verse 3 once again. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, after his suffering, by many infallible truths, being seen of him 40 days. And what did he speak of? Speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now this is something that ought to always be in our minds and in our thinking. The kingdom of God. What are we taught to pray? We're taught to pray, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. When the Lord opened His public ministry, He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When the Pharisees asked Him, what is this kingdom you're talking about? I love His answer to it in Luke chapter 17. He said the kingdom of God comes not with observation. It's not something not people like you can see. It's, you know, if you're a natural man, you can't see the kingdom of God. I can give all kinds of explanations for it, what it is, and uh, go right over you and you won't understand it. The only people who can understand the kingdom of God are people who can see it. If you're a natural man, you can't see it. He said the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. The man can't come say, there's what the kingdom of God is. It's just like that. Here it is. No, it cometh not with observation. The kingdom of God is, when he says within you, it's literally among you. He's saying, I am the kingdom of God. Now the kingdoms of this world have these two things in common, all of them. Every national government, the kingdoms of this world, either 2,000 years ago or right now, they all have these two things in common. Number one, they're under the control of death. Every single one. And the Lord said that. You remember when Satan tempted him, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he says, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you all this. It's given to me. I've got control of this. Every kingdom of this world is under the control and the dominion of the devil. That's an awful pessimistic attitude. No, it's not. It's just the truth. It's just the truth. And you can see it. Every kingdom. Uh, United States, England, Russia, China, North Korea, South Korea, Net, whatever the kingdom is, it's under satanic control. It's like every natural land. But the second thing is they're all temporary. None of them will last. They're all temporary and they all shall be broken. The Lord said to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? You couldn't do anything about it. But my kingdom. Not of this world. Paul said, You're a king then. He said, To this end was I born. That I, you know, he was born king of the Jews, wasn't he? We're looking for him who was born king of the Jews. And, uh, Paul described his kingdom with these words in Romans chapter 14, verse 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, it's not do's and don'ts, <coughs> it's not rules and regulations. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God, remember the book when the Lord said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom of God is about the righteousness of Jesus Christ being the only righteousness there is. You believe that? The only righteousness there is. The only way I can come into God's presence is having His righteousness as my personal righteousness before God. You know, when the Lord said, Blessed are they who persecute for righteousness' sake, 
It's not talking about blessed day or persecuted for doing good things and doing good deeds. It's talking about being persecuted for maintaining that the righteousness of Christ is the only righteousness there is. And there is no other righteousness. Now that is the kingdom. His righteousness. As we'll think of this scripture. Uh, the heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel so that they, that they might be saved. Are they being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's righteousness and peace. There's only one thing that gives me peace. Is if his righteousness really is the only righteousness. If you leave me looking somewhere else, I lose my peace. If I think I, there's something I need to come up with, I don't have peace. I'm scared to death because I think I won't come up with it. But oh, what peace there is in knowing that the righteousness of Jesus Christ is my personal righteousness before God, that I am in, and God is well pleased with me. Peace. You know what else comes out of that? Joy. The joy and peace of believing. And that's what the kingdom of God is. He spake to them the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, I, I tried to think, what, what would he talk about? I mean, well, you get the whole Bible to, to know what he's talking about when we're talking about the things pertaining to the kingdom. But there's basically three things that I was thinking of that I, I, I want to know about the kingdom of God. Who's the king? Who are the subjects of that kingdom? Then how do you get into this kingdom? I want to be part of this kingdom, don't you? I want to be in the kingdom of God. Who's the king? Well, that's easy to, to answer. The king of kings. And the Lord of lords. That's Christ is called the king of kings. All other kings are his pawns. Doing his will. Bringing about his purpose to pass. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. That's who the king of this kingdom is, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born king. They crucified him because he's king. That was the accusation written against him, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, but how he was raised as a mighty king. And he, all oh, the thief understood this. He said, you come back into your kingdom for me. Jesus Christ the Lord is the king of this kingdom, and what a king he is. He's the eternal king. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. That's who the king is. The Lord Jesus Christ. Now, not everybody's in this kingdom. Who are the subjects of this kingdom? You know, Christ gives us a perfect and clear description of exactly who's in this kingdom. And the Beatitudes. The first beatitude and the last beatitude is theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So turn with me for a moment to Matthew chapter 5. This is who is in the kingdom of heaven. Everybody in the kingdom of heaven is just like this. Verse 1, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who are the poor in spirit? They who have nothing to recommend themselves to God. That's it. They who can't come up with anything to bring. They're absolutely poverty stricken. And the Lord said, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, blessed are they the poor. Do you mourn over your sin? Do you mourn over your sin? You're mourning is associated with death. That's where the word is most associated with death. When 
your loved one is still alive, there's still some hope, and you're praying that the Lord God would do something for them. But when they die, and there's nothing you can do to bring them back, you mourn. When you see that there is nothing you can do about your sin, then you mourn over your sin. Now that's the mark of being in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5, blessed are the meek. Who is a meek person? A meek person is someone not weak, a meek person is someone who really believes that God controls everything. And whatever he does is right, and whatever he brings into my life is right, just, holy, and true. Because God did it. That's what a meek person is. It's someone who believes everything God does is right, and they bow before whatever he does. And then he says in verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Why do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Because you feel like you don't have any. When I'm hungry, it's because his stomach is empty and it's wanting something. If you're hungry and thirst after righteousness, it's because you don't believe you have any and you want it. You desire it. And this is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be healed. <clears throat> Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful. Now, if I have experienced God's mercy, I will be merciful. And if I refuse to be merciful, I know nothing of the mercy of God. I love that passage of Scripture. I think it's Matthew 12 where he said, Lord, what this means, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice. <coughs> and they never learned it. Mercy. Merciful. If you know anything of God's mercy toward you, the freeness of His mercy toward you, you will be merciful. And if you're not merciful, you're not in the kingdom. This is what they all have in common. And then he says in verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Now, everyone who's poor, everyone who mourns over their sin, everyone who's meek before God, everyone who hungers and thirsts after righteousness, everyone who is merciful, is pure in heart. This is the new heart given in the new birth. The heart, the nature that does not sin. It really is pure. And you know the only people who really see themselves as nothing but sin in and of themselves are people with pure hearts. You know, natural man can't see that. There was a time when I didn't understand anything about sin. I do now. And I see myself, I see the sinful of what is it that sees that? The pure heart? The new heart. That's what understands who God is and who I am and my need of Christ and His righteousness. That's the pure in heart. Um, every believer possesses this pure heart. If somebody says, well, I've got a really pure heart. It doesn't have any sin. It's, it's, a, it's a real good, pure heart. I have nothing but good motive. You're blind. That's not a pure heart. That's an utterly corrupt heart under the dominion of sin. The pure heart is that which sees sin and sees Christ. And then it says in verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, a peacemaker is someone who preaches the gospel of peace, who believes the gospel of peace, and is a peacemaker, not trying to start fights and contentions and so on, but a peacemaker. Everyone in the kingdom of God is a peacemaker. If I'm not a peacemaker, I'm not in the kingdom of God. I'm in some kind of kingdom, but it's not God's kingdom. And then he says in verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I've already commented on that. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now there is a description of those who are in the kingdom of heaven. Now, the Beatitudes are not something I'm to reach for 
and strive for and hope to be. This is a description of every single child of God. All of those descriptions are descriptive of those who truly are in the kingdom of heaven. Now, the last question, the first question, who's the king? Well, the king of kings, the Lord Jesus. Who's in the kingdom of heaven? Well, the Lord tells us who's in the kingdom of heaven in the Beatitudes. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They're the ones in the kingdom. We see that. Now, third question. How do I get in the kingdom? I want to be in this kingdom. I do. I want to be in this kingdom. How can a man get in the kingdom of heaven? Well, first of all, you have to be elect. I mean, that's just the way it is. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now the first way I can only be in the kingdom is if I'm elected to the kingdom. If it's prepared for me from the very foundation of the world. And I've said this recently, and somebody might argue against this, but he like don't. He like don't. Somebody that argues against this, well you're not going to be elected. That's the way you continue. God's elect, thou be his truth. And you understand that. I mean, you have some understanding. The only way I can be in the kingdom of Jesus is if he puts me in the kingdom. There's nothing I can do to initiate this. There's nothing I can do to make myself in the kingdom. This has got to be God's one from the beginning to the end. And we understand that. And I love the way the Lord said in such majesty, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit, not earn, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of world. Now to be in this kingdom, the Lord said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 20, it says your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You shall have no case in the kingdom of heaven. Now I know this, my righteousness infinitely exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees because my righteousness is the righteousness of Christ. I mean that the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees actually is very unrighteous very evil. We see that. Oh, we have a righteousness that infinitely exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And then in John chapter 3, verse 5, the Lord except ye be born again. Born from above. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, we, these entrance requirements shut us up to Christ. Don't they? I can't get myself into nature. He's going to have to do this for you. But except you be born from above. Except you be given this new nature. This holy nature. Pure heart. Except you be born from above. That's not something you can produce. How much did you have to do with your original birth? Your original conception. You had nothing to do with it. Same thing with new birth. We're shut up to Christ. Except a man be born from above. He cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, the Lord said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? In your name have we not cast out demons. And in your name have we not done many wonderful works. They thought they had the works that would get them into the kingdom. But they never did His will. What is the will of God? For you to believe on the Son. This is the work of God. What must we do that we might work the works of God? This is the work of God. You believe on him whom he has sent. What is the evidence that you really are a subject of this glorious kingdom? Here's the evidence. You believe the gospel. Let me give you one final example of what this means. 
There was a man hanging on a cross right beside the Lord. Let me tell you a little bit about this man. This little man, this, this man believed that Jesus Christ is God. Don't you fear God? He wasn't talking about God the Father. I mean, he was, but he was talking about this one hanging on the cross as God. Seeing you in the same condemnation, we need just. This man believed he deserved to be gained. We're getting the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. He believed in the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. Now, where are you at with this guy? Do you believe that he's God? Do you believe that you deserve to be damned? Do you believe that he was sinless? Well, let's go on. Lord. He called Jesus Christ Lord. He believed him to be the Lord. Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. You're not going to stay dead. You're God. You're going to come back as a mighty reigning king. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He knew that. And listen to his prayer. Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Now, my dear friend, if you have the same prayer, you got no other hope except him remembering you. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Same thing that was true of that thief is true of you today. Whatever day he takes you, that day will be with him in paradise. Who's in that kingdom? Everybody who says, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, will you show yourself alive to us by giving us the grace to believe your gospel and to pray with the dying faith. Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Bless this word for your glory and for our good. In Christ's name we pray.